Hello, everybody. How's it going? Azrin, the language nerd here. Welcome to another episode of Ask Azrin, episode number, I don't know what episode this is because I still haven't checked to see what episode number we're at. That's okay. If you're new to the segment, it's pretty straightforward. It's a segment where I get, I answer some questions about language learning. And, uh, and yeah, so today we're joined again by your interviewer, Jared. And we've decided, Jared, that Hello. we have a, a recurring segment. We need to make a graphic or something for it too, which is, uh, what do we call it? Ask, no, fun facts, but no, fun, fun facts about Jared. That's what it was. We need like okay. a little single too, like a, it like pops up on the screen. It's like, ah! like some kind of uh, something. <laughs> Might be too much work. That's okay. We need at least a picture. So Jared, yeah. what's your fun fact today about you? Okay, my fun fact this time around is that I was actually homeschooled my whole life. Well, there we go. Right from the beginning. Yeah. I would say that I didn't know that. The first, oh, do you know what? We're gonna reenact it. For people watching, we messed up. Actually, no, I messed up on the recording the first time. And so we're redoing, we're redoing, we're redoing it essentially. So the first time I was like, what? You were homeschooled? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That's I'll really just put cool. the, the audio from the other one in at the bottom. Mm -hmm. just, oh yeah, you just, can do that. Yeah. Just dub yourself. Yeah, dub it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, there's our fun fact about Jared today. Okay, I have some questions for you. So I'm going to start with the first one. Go for it. How do you measure progress in language learning? Um, there's multiple ways to do so. So one thing is a written format is if you keep journal, if you make, I'm sorry, if you write journal entries. So if you keep like a journal, almost like a diary and you write about different topics on a regular basis, for example, every day, every few days, every week, whenever you can. And over a, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 month window, basically over a over time, as you can, as you look back at some of your older journal entries, you'll notice your improvements. You'll notice how things changed. You'll notice how maybe right now you're able to write things that are longer than before. Maybe there's less mistakes than you used to write. I especially encourage people to get their journal entries corrected by someone so you can see how many mistakes you make now in comparison to before. I've done, I'm doing this with currently with one of my students in French who wants to specifically work on her writing. So it's cool to see now in comparison to four or five months ago, I think, well, yeah, four months ago, maybe five months ago, that sounds right. She used to make like 20 plus mistakes in a single piece of writing versus now she makes maybe three to four, maybe. So it's really cool to see that progression. Um, and her writing's overall better. Like she uses better vocabulary, more varied for vocabulary and uh, more grammar points. It's just better than what it used to be. So that's the way you can do it in a written format. Spoken format, you can record yourself. You can record any speaking sessions that you have. So whether that means you take private classes and you're doing conversation classes, then you record those. Whether it means you have a language exchange partner and you record your sessions with them. Heck, maybe it's even you talking to the camera and you record yourself just talking about different topics, right? And comparing your recordings to another to see you can often notice progress that way. Now. You, when you're recording yourself and looking at your progress, you have to do it in big windows, long windows of time, not a two week window. For example, if I record something today in February and I record something else at the end of February, there might not be a big difference between the two because it's only been a few weeks, if that makes sense. So it, it helps to have at least six to 12 month intervals, I would say, between your, your recording comparisons. You can actually see a difference. It can also help if the recordings, let's say I took a court recording today and I took one in six months. It's nice if you talk about something, it can be nice if you talk about something similar in both recordings. So it's the same topic two times and you can record and you can compare them side by side. Um, you can also take an official uh, certification for a language. That's another way to track your progress. In English, we have things like the IELTS, we have, um, TOEFL, we have the Cambridge exams, French has things like the DELF. In Canada, we have, a, I forget the name of it, but we have a government exam for, for um, often for work purposes, you need to pass a certain exam to demonstrate your level in French or English as well. It can go the other way, French to English too. 
So that's a very official way to register to, to kind of um, track your progress and see what your level is. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but there's there's a few that come to mind now. In, uh, in your language learning, do you track the number of words that you learn? Um, I personally don't, uh, only because I don't have a great system of doing so, but you could, it's not that hard to do. Uh, I probably could figure it out for something like, it's probably kind of figure outable for something like Mandarin, because I do have a lot of my notes and they're digital, so I could, um, I, I probably could figure it out. Especially because the way I take my notes, one thing I always have is a master vocabulary list. So everything I ever learn goes into that list. Like I just, whether it's a, a phrase, a sentence, a single word, like I just throw it all on the list. It's not organized, it's just one big long list. Um, and I review it every, I don't know, a couple times a year. I just review it, kind of scroll through it, see what I know, see what I don't know, test myself on it, quiz myself on it. So I probably could go figure it out, but I don't, it's not something I pay super close attention to. Do you think that the number of words that you learn or the number of phrases that um, you're studying, is that a good indicator of uh, progress or a level to an in extent, a language? Yeah, to an extent, but it's not the best indicator. It's an indicator, but it's not the best indicator. Like you might have a, a nice, beautiful Excel sheet that has, I've seen it actually, I've worked with students that have this nice, beautiful Excel or Word document with all these nice tables and they have all these words tracked and they're like, I know 672 words. And you're like, oh, that's fantastic. Hola, como estas? <laughs> and they can't reply. Hola, como estas means hi, how are you? For those of you who don't speak Spanish. So even the simplest question like, hi, how are you? They're unable to respond despite having their beautiful Excel sheet or table with 672 words. They can't even do something very simple. Right. So it's an indication, but it's not necessarily the best indication. And maybe that also comes back to um... Or pertains to what it means to know a word exactly yeah right because you, you have actually two types use of, it you have two types of vocabulary you've got active and passive vocabulary we might have talked about this last week i can't remember but active vocabulary are words that you know and under, uh, sorry that you understand and use on a regular basis uh, passive vocabulary are words that you understand and you know what they mean but you don't actually use them in your day-to-day -day life so a great example is someone very recently, maybe three weeks ago, two weeks ago, somebody used the word gander, like take a gander. Mm -hmm. And I understood it, but I, but I chuckled because it's my first language. If someone put a gun to my head and they said, Hey, Azrin, you need to, and they tried to get me to say the word gander. They mm -hmm. used every tool in their toolbox to make <laughs> me say the word gander. They gave me synonyms. They like, gave me lots of clues. I would have never in my wildest dreams ever thought of the word gander. I would have been like, I don't know what the word was. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I understand the word when it's said. So when you're learning other languages, that's also something that happens. You're going to know a lot of words that you never, someone could put a gun to your head and it's not coming out of your mouth. But if someone says it to you, you're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that word, duh, I know what that means. Yeah, 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 I understand that. Yeah, I know that. But if you had to say that the way they said it, using those words, you're hopeless. You couldn't do it. And that's super common. Usually your passive vocabulary is way bigger than your active vocabulary. Much, much bigger, even in English or your, your first language. Uh, for you personally, which is harder, speaking or understanding? Uh, probably, uh, oh, I see. Like in general conversation, like what's harder for me or like in general language learning terms, what's harder, speaking or listening or understanding? Yeah, in language learning. Yeah. So yeah, in language for you in language learning, which is harder, speaking yeah, or probably understanding? Probably speaking is a bit harder because it's more active, right? You have to. It's a little bit more active. You actually have to do something. You have to, you have to generate speech to communicate something that you you want or need or or or, or want to say, right? Versus listening is a lot more passive. You sit back, you're listening, you're absorbing. So for me, the speaking is a bit harder. Especially because for listening, what happens is if you, if someone says something to you or you're listening to a conversation in another language and you understand 70% of what they say, that's pretty darn good. You know what they're talking about. You know the topic. You could probably even participate in the conversation because you understood 70% and that's not, it's not a hundred percent. It's not all of it, but that's enough to, to keep up. It's enough to keep up. Now, 
If you, on the other hand, when you're speaking, only know 70% of the words of what you want to say, you might not be able to communicate what you want to say, right? Let's take a sentence with 10 words. I am a good student and, but I suck at math. There's 10 words. Let's say I don't know the word math, student, and uh, what's one more? I, and bad, or I suck. We're in real trouble, aren't we? I can't, I can't say anything there. I'm really stuck. I can't communicate what I want to say. I can't say I'm bad at math. I can't say I suck at math. I don't know the word suck. I don't know the word math. You're really stuck. You can't say what you want to say. And so now you're stuck versus yep. listening. You don't need to understand a hundred percent in order to get by. So for me, I think that's why speaking is a little bit harder. Um, and when you're speaking and you don't know the words, you have to talk around a lot of things. And I think yeah. that's a skill that yeah. it takes a lot of development, being able to say the same thing, but with different words. Right. Yeah, totally. Today in my mat, I had a Chinese, I have a Chinese uh, literature class I take that's taught in English. And because it's taught in English at my university, I take additional tutoring where I learn the same content, but we go through it in Mandarin. So I had that tutoring today where I was learning and he was talking about stuff and he asked me how my test went about, I had a Mandarin test recently. He's like, oh, how was your test at university? And I was trying to, exp I was trying to tell him how I made a, I made a mistake about the, the length of the responses. We had to give responses that were a certain length on the test. And there's like a little box where you write, where you, where you type your answer in because it was an online test. And I was trying to tell him, oh, that space where the box, or that space, that box where you write your, where you write your answer, like I made a mistake with how many words to put into it. Now, I didn't know how to say that box in Mandarin. I didn't know the word for like that box, but what I can do is I can say, oh, you know, like wh what I said was, you know, when you like take online tests, like there's like a little section and I did this. There's like a little section where you like write your, where you like write your answer. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, like that box, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, what, I didn't know the word for box, but he said it and I was like, oh, that must mean box. It must be, because what else would that mean? He's like, yeah, 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 that, that, right? That's a skill, right? You need to mm -hmm. know how to think, okay, I don't know the word for box, but I could say that little space. I know how to say space. I can say that, okay. Mm -hmm. So, And even in a, in a first language, I think that skill is exactly the same as when someone asks you to explain an expression. Yeah. Like if you have an expression that you use a lot in English um, and you, uh, and someone says, what does that mean? And you have to kind of talk around and go, well, when you're in this context, you say this because it means that. And doing that is exactly that skill in a foreign language as well when you don't have enough vocabulary. Yeah. I'm really bad at that as a side note. I'm very, very bad at, uh, I'm super bad at explaining what things mean in English. Like it's really, really challenging for me, especially when it's like, a more complex concept. It's hard do you find it uh, difficult <clears throat> to do that in foreign languages? If you don't have enough words to explain what you want to explain? Uh, uh, no, in foreign languages, I'm, I'm uh, it doesn't come, I'm better now. I used to be really bad. I, I used to be really bad. I like, I don't know that word and I'd be stuck. I'm better at it than I used to be. Um, but in, Eng in English, I find I'm much better at explaining things using visuals and pictures and examples. Like I'm way better doing that right that i am like just ex explaining it in words um yeah so um okay this is kind of a fun question sure. are you more inclined to curse in a foreign language than you would be in your native language not not in particular for me i, I don't really curse a lot period hmm. yeah no I, I, no no because <laughs> i think it talks about um if you're speaking a foreign language sometimes psychologically, you can separate yourself from what you're saying a little bit. If it's not your native language, yeah. um, it doesn't seem as personal, maybe. I've heard people describe it like that. I'm not sure what your opinions are. Um, and so I think that some people feel more comfortable to say things in a foreign language that they would never say in their native language. Not me in particular. I mean, no, I, I don't. I, I It's actually funny because in, let's speak Spanish. I speak Spanish almost as well as I speak English. Like it's comparable to my English level. Um, and yet, as I'm thinking about it now, I know way more swears in English than I do Spanish, only because in Spanish, like 
the people I hung out with, they just didn't, I mean, they never swore. They weren't that type of person. I wasn't around it. So I know some, but I don't, I'm not like an expert in Spanish swearing. But on the other hand, in French, I know quite a few swears because, and like dirty language and stuff or bad words or call it what you want to call it. Because when I, when I first was in France, I was in high school. And so in high school, the, a lot of the people I hung out with, they would just kind of say stuff like that. So I used to hear it all the time. And uh, I heard it often. I would hear swears reasonably often, way more often than I would in Spanish. So I'd be like, what does that mean? They'd be like, oh, that means, and they would tell me like, oh, okay, great. So I learned a lot more in French that way, but in Spanish or even Mandarin, like I couldn't, do I know one swear in Mandarin? Oh yeah, I know a couple actually, but very few because that's just not who I've been around, right? Mm -hmm. The people you're around have a heavy influence on how you speak and what you know and what you don't know and how you act and how you don't act. Like I could, um, I much, if I had to work in an environment that was like around a different language, this feels so strange to say, I would, my preference, would be to work in a Spanish or Mandarin environment over French. Hmm. Because, Why is I that? Use, because Mandarin I use regularly at work nowadays, I use it. And my Mandarin level is way worse than my French level, it's way lower. And yet it's still default and I have to be like, I prefer Mandarin over French. Because Mandarin I use it regularly for work now, I use it for work purposes. Um, I, for Spanish, I used to work with, I still kind of work with someone, but I used to work with someone quite a bit and our entire working relationship was in Spanish. So I have some experience with that. French, I used to, oh, I used to, used to I, someone used to work for me back in my window cleaning business too, actually. And he didn't speak much English. He only spoke Spanish. So I worked with him in Spanish. I trained him on some sales in using Spanish. So like, and we would teach him how to like, like business, like I would have to demonstrate like how to provide quotes for a window cleaning customer. And just to help them understand, I'd have to do it in Spanish to help them understand. So I have a lot more experience with it. So I feel more comfortable because I've been in those circles, but in French, despite me having spoken French for 23 years, me being very fluent in French, I've never used French in a professional capacity, like for, that's not true. I have professional capacity, but never for my work, not for my right. work. So for Mandarin, I'm not perfect at it. I'd probably weirdly be better in French if I had to just start using French at work today. I could, I could figure it out. I could do it, but I'd feel more nervous in French than I would in Mandarin. Even and like, would the nervousness come from, um, like certain specific vocabulary that's only for this job that you wouldn't use outside of it? That you yeah, wouldn't it's be because, uh, it's because, to before? exactly. It's because it's, it, it would be very comparable to maybe people listening or watching this can relate when you get a new job for the first time. And let's say it's a, it's a, it's a customer service oriented job. P picture your first customer service job. If you worked in a, in retail or you worked in maybe some kind of sales job, or maybe you had, maybe you're like a secretary or it's maybe it's just me, but when I got my first customer service oriented job where I had to talk to other people, it was, really awkward even though it was in english i wasn't used to speaking in that way you have to have your tone of voice a certain way you have to use certain like a certain not formal way of speaking but a more professional way of speaking like it's it's different mm -hmm. it's a different way of speaking that even in english yeah when it's your first job it's kind of awkward at first until you get used to it right mm -hmm. what do you do if a angry customer comes in and you're working in customer service like how what do you do like that's different mm -hmm. right so for French, okay. I don't have practice with that, but, but I do have some practice in Mandarin. I do have some practice in Spanish, but I don't in French. I don't have practice with it. I think it's comparable to people that will come from a different country and they'll study at a university. So let's say mm -hmm. they're from Mexico and they go to the US and they study uh, engineering or something like that. And uh, you, you learn a lot of technical terms. And by the time they finish their degree, a lot of people will say that they would only know those terms in the language that they were taught in. Right. Even though their native language might be stronger than that. Mm -hmm. um, so they say, okay, well, uh, I learned how to say whatever gravitational potential energy or something like that in, in English, but I don't know what that is in Spanish, even though Spanish is my first language. 
I've heard mm-hmm. stories like that from people. Uh, what was one of the most defining moments in your language learning so far? There's quite, it's a very good question. Man, I feel like if you were to ask me that multiple times, I can give you multiple answers because there's so many like very turn point defining moments. Does that make sense? I think that, I think a lot of language can, a lot of language learners can prob- probably say that I would say. For me, the first one that comes to mind was when I was 15 and I went to France for three months. I lived with the family. I lived in a very small, not even a village, a hamlet. Uh, I went to school in a small town, a a town, yeah, a town, I suppose, a population of roughly, I believe it's 80,000 people, maybe 100,000 people. So very small, maybe less than that even. Regardless, a very small, small city, maybe a town, depending on how you view it. So that was a very defining, defining moment in language learning, especially because it was after that trip that I started to realize that I liked language learning. Before that, I didn't really know, didn't really, hadn't realized it. And so from a linguistic perspective, um, do you remember a specific moment when you were there? Hmm, like one specific moment. Let's see, maybe I would say. Or maybe a period of time. Yeah, I have a few moments. I I do have some, like there's some very vivid memories I have that were, that were defining moments, I suppose. And usually they're around learning a very specific skill that was hard or or taking, Mm -hmm. learning some kind of, some kind of uh, lesson or taking some, learning something from it. So for example, I remember like it was yesterday being in the shower and practicing my French R's. Like, Mm -hmm. je crois, je crois, j'ai trois chiens, trois, trois, théâtre, théâtre. Right, and obviously I couldn't do it at the time. It was really hard, I was practicing, right? Or like, un, un, like a practicing like the three nasal vowels in French like practicing that I can remember that very vividly Um, another vivid um, vivid memory is we used to watch this show I think it was five days a week Monday through Friday if I'm not mistaken it might have been on weekends too but definitely Monday through Friday we watched a show called Tout le monde veut prendre sa place and it's a game show and I remember initially not not really understanding what they would say. The host was kind of a comedian and he had a very particular way of speaking that was kind of fast and he made a lot of jokes that were hard to understand for me. Um, the questions that they have are often often based heavily in French culture. So you have to know something about France to fully appreciate some of the questions that they would ask the contestants. And like, I remember near the end of the trip, watching that show and being like hey i actually understand most of this now (laughs) versus before i didn't understand like anything i remember that silver tv we used to like have the kitchen table the tv was there in fact they've done renos in that house now i was i was there a couple of years ago i visited i think they've renovated i don't think that tv's there anymore i don't think they have that so that's completely gone now so well and that's where your language your love of language just kind of started out of that yeah, it started there. That's where it started. After that, after returning from that trip is where it started. Like that's where it really, really started. Well, I guess we can finish that up there. Um, that was a fun episode. And uh, thank you everybody for, for watching slash listening. So actually I might turn this into a podcast as well. Why not? It's very podcast friendly, I think. So um, any final thoughts, Jared? No, that's it. Okay. Well, I'll see you later. See you guys.